Hi, I'm Patrick Manning at Black Desert Resort. We are proud sponsors of Beyond the Game. I recognize that wins aren't always measured by points. Scoreboards don't always define champions, but the story this athlete has to tell, it does. This is why Black Desert Golf Course is proud to sponsor Beyond the Game to share this inspiring story with you. Please enjoy. You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your host, Josh Furlong. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I am Josh Furlong, and I'm happy to be back again for another episode uh, it's it's good to be back. Uh, we got football going, and uh, obviously that makes things very, very good for for us to talk about things. So uh, I'm excited to be able to uh, keep going with this and uh, talk kind of some developments in in fall camp. And uh, there's there's not a ton. I mean, admittedly, there's just not a ton uh, right now with Utah. Uh, they have a lot of of depth and and a lot of talent, and uh, it's a lot of the same stuff from last year, but uh, there there are definitely updates, and, and we'll talk about that. So uh, before we do that, though, I want to tell you about our partners, Black Desert, who are helping at the KSL.com Beyond the Game video series. The videos highlight various athletes and give an inside look into their life. Recently, we talked with former Utah offensive lineman Garrett Bowles about how a second chance at life allowed him to pay it forward to troubled youth. You can check out that video and many others on KSL.com. Black Desert is a new resort destination in St. George that features a championship Tom Weiskopf 19-hole golf course that combines a private club fill with destination resort golf amid lava fields and 360-degree vistas. Black Desert is changing entertainment in southern Utah, and they're just beginning. Black Desert, where remarkable is within reach. Home of the Black Desert Championship PGA Tour. All right, so uh, let's get back at this. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about fall camp stuff, but uh, first I wanted to kind of jump into... Uh, one of the developments of this week, and that was the USA Today Coaches Poll, which is now called the US LBM Coaches Poll. Can I just, like, can we be done with this stuff? Like, just call it the Coaches Poll. I, I mean, that's what everybody's going to call it. But, like, I understand corporate sponsors, and I understand that, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one that's a proponent of being able to get money to help fund what we need to do, uh, especially on the sports side, to make sure that it keeps going. But sometimes it's kind of a little ridiculous to call it that. So tirade over, uh, <laughs> but I think it's just kind of a dumb name. Um, regardless, uh, Utah is ranked number 13. Uh, they're the highest ranked team in the Big 12. Uh, there's four other teams from the Big 12 that were ranked, including Kansas State at 17, Oklahoma State at 18, Arizona 21, and Kansas at 24. There was a handful of other teams that were receiving votes, and, and that's to be expected. Uh, that's including West Virginia, Iowa State, UCF, Texas Tech, and Colorado. Um, so you know, there's, there's, there's a handful there. Uh, the Big 12 actually was the third or had the third most teams uh, out of the conferences, as can be expected. The SEC and Big 10 uh, make up the, the majority of that. Uh, if anything, they make up the majority of the top 10. I mean, as to be expected, that's what conference realignment has been all about. Uh, surprisingly, and maybe not surprisingly, uh, there were no G5 teams included in the top 25. Memphis was the highest one to receive votes. Uh, Boise State was a little close to that too. But uh, I think you're starting to see where this these polls, these top 25s, are, are very much so going to be uh, Power 4 teams, I guess is how we're designating them now. But that's just kind of the the lay of the land right now. I think that's that's how it's going to go. So... Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, we don't take a lot of stock to preseason polls, coaches polls, especially these are essentially, uh, members of the athletic staff that, uh, are putting these together. It's not the actual coach. Maybe some, maybe some programs ask their coach, you know, how they would rank teams. I, I would be surprised, um, knowing how that works a little bit firsthand. I, I don't, I don't see that happening. So this is, this is just what some, somebody on staff, uh, decided to do. Uh, Utah is not included in that this year. Uh, they had a voting member the last few years, but there's there's nobody on the Utah staff that's voting in this year's coaches poll. So, um, you know, it is what it is. W with this, I, I, I kind of wanted to jump into this a little bit and look at the playoff scenarios. If you were to say, 
this was the final top 25, right? Like this is the final one uh, as they're about to do the selection committee. It, it presents a, a little bit of a look at, at kind of how how these teams are going to jockey for position in this 12-team playoff. And, and there's a little bit difference to this, right? You know, the four top teams from each conference, so that doesn't mean the four top teams like one through four. It means the four top teams from all of the four top conferences, they get those first four bites. So they're one, two, three, and four. And then everybody else is, an, is you know, essentially slotted based on uh, where they land in the poll. It, barring the fifth conference champion or the you know that that they automatically get in that doesn't mean that they are now slated number five they could still be 12 if they are below all those other teams um, but that's how it goes so I kind of I kind of pulled this out a little bit to kind of look at, at what the playoff scenario would be um, if this is supposed to be the final one right so you look at it the buys would be Georgia they win the SEC Ohio State they win the Big Ten Florida State, they win the ACC, and Utah, they win the Big 12. So those are your four top seeds. Utah would get a first-round bye in the playoffs, which uh, unfortunately means you wouldn't get a game in Salt Lake City, right? You wouldn't have somebody coming to town and uh, being able to you know, play Utah in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, Utah would have to wait and be in one of those, uh, you know, the bowl games that are designated, you know, something like the, the Rose Bowl, the Orange Bowl, Peach Bowl, those types of, the, of venues. So it would be your traditional New Year's Six-type bowl games, but... Uh, um, I think Utah would be fine with that, knowing that they won the conference. Uh, they get an opportunity to be in uh, the quarterfinal round of the, the playoff and have a chance to play into the semifinals. I think that's uh, a great opportunity and, and something they would, they would love. So beyond that, though, the way it would be slated, you would have Oregon as a number five, Texas six, Alabama seven, Ole Miss eight, Notre Dame nine, Michigan 10, Penn State 11, and Memphis, even though they weren't ranked, ranked in the top 25 they were the highest, you know, uh, G5 team. So we're going to put them in there at number 12. Uh, that's how they would land. So even though they, they could be outside of the top 25, because they would be the highest vote getter of, of this scenario, they would be in the conference or the, the college football playoffs. So um, interesting situation there. The matchups would be pretty, pretty interesting, honestly. Like, I think these would be a great opening round of the playoffs. You would have Oregon playing Memphis in the first round, and the winner would go on to face Utah. Texas and Penn State would open up their their matchup with the winner of that going on to play Florida State. Alabama would play, play Michigan, and the winner would go play Ohio State. Now, that, that pairing all around would be phenomenal. Uh, Alabama-Ohio State's always a good one. But then you get a potential rematch of, of the rivalry game, you know, Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, you know, having that in, in the college football playoffs would be insane. Um, and then you get Ole Miss um, playing Notre Dame for a chance to go up against Georgia. Uh, you can see why the 12-team playoff is attractive to people, right? I understand there's some people that still love the 14 playoff. You know, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but you can see that a lot of these are those blue blood teams, right? You've got a lot of these teams that uh, they're going to be in this conversation regardless of what happens. Uh, they're going to be the teams that are jockeying for position, uh, where to go. You know, any, any of these teams in the top 15, I would say, initially, are most likely going to be in that conversation. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, teams outside of the top 15 aren't. Um, but you can kind of get the, the point that most of these teams are going to stay at the top barring some injuries or, or some other stuff. So um, it's a good opportunity uh, for Utah. But looking at this, um, it's a tough scenario, right? You've got to battle with the SEC and the Big Ten uh, and really try to fight to get an at-large bid unless you win the conference. In this scenario, Utah is the only team from the Big 12 coming um, to, the, to the playoffs. There's no Kansas State. There's no Oklahoma State. Uh, obviously, there's going to be changes in how this is made up, and as the games are getting played, you know maybe some teams sneak up into those top ten ranges from the Big Twelve. But um, this is this is the challenge where you know the twelve team playoffs continues to just grow uh, for the SEC and Big Ten. They get more teams in there. Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, problems that way, and everybody else is left out on on the outside. I mean, it's the same for the ACC. Florida State is the only team from the ACC that would be included in there. Uh, you know, Notre Dame gets their at-large bid and they have some kind, you know, some ties with the ACC, but they're independent in football. So uh, this is very much so a, a boon for the SEC and the Big Ten. Um, and so it, it, it becomes a challenge for teams that don't win the conference to be able to be in there. With that said, you know, let's say Utah doesn't win the conference championship. If they can remain in that top uh, you know, 10 spot, they're going to be fine. And, and that's a challenge with losing a conference championship. But 
uh, you know, there, there's opportunities there. It's just a matter of how this shakes out, and, and I'm curious to see how it goes. So that's just looking at it from the coach's poll. Coach's poll is always one that, you know, it, it can be a guide, but the second the AP poll comes out, I feel like everybody kind of uh, dismisses it. The AP poll comes out uh, next Monday at 10 a.m. I'll have my AP ballot uh, as an AP voter out maybe at the end of this week, if not uh, Monday morning. We'll see how I I decide to go with it, uh, try to try to get it done. So uh, that'll that's kind of where it goes. Once the AP poll comes out, that's where people take a little bit more stock into that. I know a lot of people are frustrated with preseason polls and, and polls in general at the first few weeks. Uh, really, you just have to look at them as kind of how people are viewing your program. Utah's obviously going to be viewed highly. Uh, the fact that they're they're expected to win the conference uh, that shows that you know they're going to be viewed high and, and they're going to be inside the top fifteen somewhere. Generally speaking, the the coaches poll traditionally like ranks Utah lower, uh, so you'll probably see Utah a little higher in the AP. But I wouldn't be surprised if they're anywhere in in that range. Uh, it, it it honestly doesn't matter. Uh, you know, Utah as long as they continue to win, they're going to be wherever they need to, and and they'll be fine. So. Uh, you know, by the end of the, the season with these these polls, you know, it works its way, way out, right? Like you can have a team that's in there and you're like, there's no way they're a top 10 team. And then they go on to win or lose. And uh, it kind of bears itself out that way. And, and it'll all make sense. So you have those until the actual college football playoff selection committee chooses theirs, uh, you know, November-ish, late October. Um, and then that becomes the official one. And, and we'll kind of go from there. But um, this is this is an opportunity for Utah, right? You win the conference, you're an automatic buy in, in the playoffs, you're set. Uh, you get that first round buy and everything's good, but uh, you can still play into it if you're you're still one of those top 10-ish teams. So good, good opportunity for Utah if they can take care of business. So speaking of Utah, let's get into fall camp. Uh, this is the second week of, of fall camp. Uh, so, you know, the first week is generally kind of the slower portion. It's not slow for the players. These guys have a pretty massive install. Uh, you know, the coaches are, are pushing them and, and forcing them to really acclimate to what the season is going to be like, right? So there's a lot of conditioning. There's a lot of, of prep, and they're, they're pushing these guys to their limits, essentially, where um, it's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, this is still that ramp-up period that Kyle had talked about where they're going to uh, change – how they did it, right? They had two days on, took a day off, three days on, took a day off, four days on, and then it kind of goes into a traditional, you know, everyday type uh, scenario. Um, and so th- that's kind of how the makeup will be. This is this has been a tough task, right? Like pads came on this week. This is where they're going to be. Uh, it's going to be a much more of a challenge now that you're starting to see these guys hit each other more. Uh, you're going to start seeing probably more injuries uh, simply because that's just the nature of it. Utah's still trying to do whatever they can to limit those but you're going to see them, right? It, it's probably just some nicks um, here and there, and, and maybe there's some some bigger injuries. You, you hope not, especially barring what happened last year, but uh, that's that's where we're going to be right now. So there's going to start to be a little bit more separation. We're going to har- start hearing Kyle Whittingham talk about a little bit more guys and cementing their roles in the depth chart and, and, and things that way, but there's there's still not a full pecking order in a lot of these positions. Utah is going to have their first full scrimmage on Thursday. So tomorrow, if you're listening to this on a Wednesday, um, and that's that's really where things are going to kind of start divvying up for those ones, twos, threes, uh, and everybody else falling in line after that. They, they really want to have everything settled by Monday uh, to make sure that they really hit the ground running, right? It's not quite... It's not quite game mode, right? They have a couple weeks until they get into that where they start focusing on their opponents and doing that. Um, but right now it's still the conditioning, trying to figure out, you know, the jockeying for positions and different things that way. So, um, But with that said, Kyle talked about how the QB battle, the QB2 battle, we obviously know Cam is, is that number one guy. The QB2 battle, he says it's shaping up. Uh, and that they, he saw a little bit of separation last week. Um, nothing that is going to give them uh, the understanding that they need to kind of stop that competition, right? It's not like they've found a guy that they feel like at least they're not announcing that publicly. They wanted to wait for this week, get into that scrimmage. It's one thing to look good in, in scrimmage where you're not really going through full motions, where you're not getting tackled, doing different things like that, um, and going through a scrimmage where you're able to actually – manage it in a much, much more game-like setting, right? These quarterbacks still aren't going to be tackled. Uh, Utah's not putting them through that, so that's that's not going to happen. 
but you can at least get an idea with how they process information, right? Are, are they getting sacked, you know, touch sacks? Or, or are they, you know, going through their progressions? Uh, that's how it's going to be. But you've got three quarterbacks especially. you got Sam Heward. You've got uh, Brandon Rose and uh, Isaac Wilson, who are all battling equally for this, right? Um, Kyle says it's not a dead heat anymore, um, but at the same time, he's not ready to go public with who he thinks it's going to be, and so we're going to see some of that on uh, after Thursday. So Monday, I'm hoping, you know, Kyle said this before and then decides to keep it close to the vest. Uh, with, a, with a backup position, I have to imagine he'd be a little bit more open because there's really not any gamesmanship to withholding that information unless he honestly wants to uh, keep that close to the vest for whatever reason he wants to. And, you know, that that happens over the years. Uh, Andy Ludwig, as I mentioned, I believe last time, had talked about how they want to do this in the right timeline, right? They're not going to rush it. um, But at the same time, you want to get these guys settled because next week, in theory, you need Cam taking a majority of those reps and then you need that backup taking the rest of them. The other two... And then, you know, Luke Batari, who's expected to be that fifth guy, uh, they're going to get, the, you know, their own reps basically outside of the practice setting. They might get ones here and there, um, but it's it's more for the guys that, that are going to be playing. And as that two deep, uh, the other guys will be working with scout team and, and, and some other scenarios. So it's, it's a challenge. Uh, they obviously have to be prepared and ready, and they'll get occasional reps, but for the most part, it's Cam. Um, and then, you know, 20%, I don't know what the actual uh, demarcation is there, but uh, the, the rest of those will go to your QB2. So we'll see how that goes. I, I honestly, you know, I've given my opinion on who it is. I think uh, Sam Heward obviously gives great upside in the sense that he's a guy that has done it. He's been at a Division One level, and yeah, it's been at the FCS level in Summit, Washington, um, but he's at least had some some experience that way. His biggest problem, though, is he's coming into this really new, right? He he doesn't know the system, and he's learning at a quick rate. And and everybody loves uh, who he is. You know, Kyle said it's he's executing it. He says pretty darn good given the situation because uh, he wasn't here in spring. Um, but it's just a huge deficit not to be able to to have that background, right? Brandon Rose has the most experience in the system and he's been making progress over the years. And so has he made that next progress to give the the coaching staff the the confidence where he could be QB2? You know, Isaac Wilson was, you know, on paper, uh, according to the coaching staff, I guess I should say, uh, you know, neck and neck with Brandon Rose. You know, he's he's going to take that next step and, and, and where does that go? Isaac, Isaac is one of those most intriguing ones that... I, to me, I don't, I don't feel like they have to rush it, right? I don't think they have to rush to try to make him QB2 unless he's night and day different than anybody else. Uh, he can come into that system, lead the scout team, gain a lot of valuable reps that way, kind of go the Cam Rising model where you go lead the scout team for a year, you know, get that insight knowledge with Andy Ludwig, go against the number one defense, really try to up your game that way, uh, and, and learn the system that way in, a, in kind of like a harmless way. He doesn't have to worry about it that way. And then come in the next year and battle it out for the, the starting role. I think anybody that saw the spring game understands the kind of potential that he has. Uh, if you've watched him at Corner Canyon, you can see the potential. It's just at a different uh, level, obviously. The game is much faster. Those windows are much tighter. Um, but you see somebody that is is going to not shy away from that. He's, he's more than happy to be able to attack that. And and I think you've got somebody that's generally willing to wait, right? Like he's not going to wait all day or, or or for several seasons, but um, this is a guy that they feel like they can kind of project uh, and, and kind of utilize in kind of the old system of QBs where you put them on the, you know, put them on the scout team, let them develop in the system. And then when it comes his time, he's, he's ready to go. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Curious to see how that separation shakes out, but um, it, it'll be interesting. You know, we, we got an opportunity to talk to Sam Heward for the first time this week. Really articulate kid. Uh, you know, he understands his, his, his situation right now. Obviously, he wants to compete, and he wants to be that, that number two QB. Um, but I don't get the sense that, you know, he would be uh, devastated if not. I think he would still continue to, to fight, uh, continue to battle for, the, for that job, knowing that he needs more time in the system. Obviously, he wants to see the field. Obviously, he wants to play. Um, but I get the sense that, you know, he, he understands this better than, than many maybe would expect and uh, understand what's ahead of him. So I, I actually want to play the full interview that we did with him. It's about four minutes long. I don't, I don't generally like to do this because it's a long time. 
Uh, but I thought he had a lot of good things to say. Uh, I think he understands the situation very well and understands kind of the the, the hurdle that he has to, to cross to be able to get to where he needs to. So uh, I'm going to play that right now, and, and we'll kind of go to that point. And how's it been so far being with Utah? It's been awesome. I mean, this program is a machine. Um, it's one of the best programs in the country, and it's just what a blessing it is every day to come here and compete with these guys and be around these teammates and grow with these guys and get to know them all and play for these coaches it's pretty special it's been awesome you had a lot of places you could have gone <coughs> coming behind cam what was so attractive about that yeah i mean i think there are many reasons you know why i wanted to come here i mean this place is is one of the best programs in the country like i mentioned and you know this place has there's been a ton of great stability and then you know they've proven so much here and just the opportunity to come here in a great system and just compete and get better you know i know coming here wasn't going to be easy learning a tough playbook you know getting back up to this level it takes some time to get back to this speed um, but, you know, I know I have such great people around me that are going to help me get there. And, you know, I know this thing's a process. And like you said, at the end of the day, there's not many better people to learn from than Cam out there. And he's been unbelievable since I've gotten here. Um, what a great mentor he is. And for me to come in here, just compete and push myself, be, also be able to pick his brain has just been awesome. What did you, as you mentioned, you know, coaching stability was a big factor in your decision to come to Utah. But ultimately, you know, as you look back at your time in Washington, what disappointment came from that? And how much did that influence your decision to ultimately make it? Yeah, you know, honestly, looking back, you know, it taught me so much. You know, was it tough? Definitely, yes. You know, was it tough to leave there? For sure. Um, you know, I definitely wanted to stick it out there and hopefully get an opportunity down the road, but I need to go play. Um, you know, I didn't really get a senior year of high school because of COVID. I hadn't played in two years. When Mike announced he was coming back, you know, I knew I wasn't going to play, and that would have been a fourth year. And that's pretty tough as a quarterback. Um, so I kind of had to make that move and go play. But, you know, I definitely wanted to get back to this level. Um, you know, but just looking back on that whole experience at UW, going to Cal Poly, I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, it's allowed me to be in this position now, knowing that this is a great opportunity. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. But I feel like all those things that I've gone through these past few years have prepared me to come in here and just compete every day and know that this thing is a process and know that when I get an opportunity, I'll be ready to go. Sam, you were one of the guys that went up to the youth reservation over the summer. Mm -hmm. How helpful was that in getting accustomed to what the culture is here? It was awesome for me. You know, being I, – I think I've only been to the state of Utah one time for an AU basketball tournament in sixth grade. <laughs> Um, before this, um, you know, when I took my visit here, loved it. Um, so being able to go do that and kind of see a different part of Utah and be able to get, learn more about, you know, the Utes and this place and what this place means and be able to go help, you know, those guys out and be able to work that camp was such an awesome, op awesome opportunity. And me and Isaac had a great time working with the quarterback there. It was such a blast. And it was just overall, it was a great experience and, you know, something I'm super thankful that I was able to go do. How did Cal Poly help you grow as a quarterback? I think just being able to be back on the field. You know, I think when you go about three years without really playing, um, you know, it can be tough. You know, part of you is like, can I still do this? You know, I, I know I can, but, you know, I, I want to have that feeling again. So just being able to go back out there and, you know, be the leader of the team and, you know, to go out there and just compete and go through some losses, some adversity and fight through it out there on the field was, you know, the best thing I could have done. And I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that I got to go play for, you know, my high school coach again for another year and, you know, build some relationships with some of the, you know, my best friends I'll have for the rest of my life there. And just overall, being able to go there, it's such a great place and just kind of have a little bit of a reset, take a step back, grow not just as a quarterback, but as a person. Um, it was just so beneficial looking back on it. And I'm really th thankful for that experience. What motivates you as a quarterback? Um, Honestly, I love the game of football. I just love being able to come out here and compete. And, you know, when I turn on the tape and, you know, these past few days here, it's like, man, I got such a long way to go. But, you know, I know that I have the people around me to help push me, and I know that I'm in a great opportunity to just continue to just get better every single day. And, you know, being a quarterback and waking up every day and having that challenge, does it get hard? You know, for sure. But, you know, I know that, you know, I'm built for this and the things I've gone through have helped prepare me to just know that this thing's going to, you know, be a process. And, you know, there's going to be some ups and downs to it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you just got to keep pushing and keep working. And that's why I love about it because it's not easy and it's hard. But, you know, I wouldn't want it any other way because I love to compete and I love to just push myself every single day. What's your greatest strength right now as a quarterback and maybe the thing you feel you need to work on about? Yeah, you know, I think definitely, you know, one of my biggest strengths, you know, I feel like as a quarterback has been my deep ball and the ability to push the ball down the field with accuracy. Um, I feel like I'm able to process and make decisions and be accurate with the football. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing I need to work on here is just kind of, um, you know, settling down a little bit, just getting more comfortable. But, you know, I'm running some new plays for the first time, going against one of the best defenses in the country um, at disguising stuff. And so, you know, I know it's going to take some time. Um, but just being able to be out here and just get better and really work on those things and footwork and the timing and all that stuff, you know, it just comes with the reps and it comes with time. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely a lot of things that I'm looking forward to continue to get better at.
It was a, a great interview with him. Obviously, he's, he, as I mentioned, he's articulate. He understands the situation, uh, loves to compete. Uh, he wants to be able to be in that situation where he's, he's fighting for the number two spot. Uh, this isn't a guy that's you know going to be satisfied with, with uh, anything less, but at the same time, he understands where he's at. He's coming in into this late. Uh, he joined the program about a month before fall camp started, so... Uh, there's there's a lot of time needed for him to really develop and, and get to where he needs to go. But there's a lot of optimism around him. Uh, you know, Cam Rising said he was really fired up by by seeing how well he's been able to do different things and, and how quickly he learns. Uh, the question is, you know, how how quickly can he learn that in a way where he's not thinking about it on the field, right? There, there comes a point where you understand how it works, but you've got to understand how it works in, you know, three, four seconds where you're trying to diagnose what's going on with uh, with the defense, you know, what, what the play call is, you know, what the different things are going on. And uh, he's, he's obviously got a, a good mind for that. It's just a question of how can he do it in a, uh, a way that's not going to make him kind of freeze up on the field, especially under Ludwig's system, which is pretty difficult, right? I mean, it's not an easy system, and uh, you have to have somebody that's pretty cerebral and, and, and understands the system pretty well. So curious to see how that goes. You know, don't don't be surprised if Sam isn't listed as a QB2 uh, when a depth chart comes out or it, when Kyle decides to, to make it known. Um, but at the same time, you know, he's he's got a lot of opportunity and potential ahead of him. Um, so I'm curious to see how the coaching staff plays this and, and kind of where they, they put it in there. But, um, you know, it, you, you hope uh, for Utah's sake that they don't have to go into QB2 except for garbage minutes, um, you know, that Cam is healthy and, and that everything will be well there. So obviously they want to have somebody set. They don't want to have a situation like last year where you're kind of scrambling to find a quarterback and um, maybe that still happens depending on, on what happens on the field. You know, guys can be listed as QB2 and then – they throw out QB three for, uh, for some plays. So, uh, really curious to see how that goes, and, and you know, I'm, I, we'll see what Kyle says next week if he decides to, to give any information on that. Shifting over to running back right now, running back has been a position that there's been a lot of, you know, I- intrigue in. I'll say, uh, you know, f- I've I've seen a lot of fans really worried about this position group. Uh, I, I don't fully understand it. Uh, I, d- I don't think that there's really any concern here. And yeah, you want to have the guy that, you know, you say is is the Zach Moss or the Devontae Booker or, you know, any of these guys that is going to be your bell cow back. But I don't I don't generally get the sense that this is a room that is is of concern, right? There are there are issues, right? There there are things where you want somebody to be that guy. It just makes it easier. Um, but Utah's got enough talent uh, to be able to kind of mix and match what they want to do, right? They don't have to have that guy that's going to be, uh, you know, an every down back. They can have him be, you know, every, every few downs, you know, and then mix it in with somebody else that's an off speed or, or, or you know, different different ways to kind of mix up those packages. Um, as of now, uh, Kyle has said that Mackay Bernard is that guy, and I, I don't think that comes as a shock to anybody uh, he's a guy that kind of comes in as the full, complete package in terms of being able to have good vision on the field. He's a great pass protector. He, you know, a good steward of the program. Uh, he's also a great receiver. You know, he can catch the balls in the backfield. Uh, there's a lot that you can do with Makai Bernard that allows him to be kind of that complete back. But beyond that, they want, they want you know, the prototypical guy that's a bigger body, has something there. Somebody like that is, is a Mike Mitchell uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about him. Kyle had said on on Monday that he's likely on his heels and really starting to emerge. Uh, it, it's not just a matter of, you know, he can hit the holes hard or he can do different things that, that you, you think of as a running back. It's a whole complete thing with him, right? He's got to be able to um, be dialed in on and off the field. He's got to be able to pick up the, the pass protection stuff. He's got to be able to catch the ball. And, and granted, there's enough you know talent, tight ends, wide receivers, that you don't necessarily need that as, as a huge selling point. But running backs still have to catch the ball, right? There, there's still different plays and different things that you need them to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I want to see kind of how he he develops there and, and what we're able to get there. Um but beyond that, they, they also moved, you know, freshman Hunter Andrews over to running back. He was a linebacker, played both in, in high school, um, but Kyle has said he's shown really well. Uh, they moved him initially over because Jalen Glover was out the first week a little bit with some, some nagging injuries. He's back. Uh, he's been fine. Um, but he, they mostly did that also because, they you know, some of those younger guys, they don't have the, the frame. Uh, they're not as big. None of them are over 200 pounds. Uh, they... they they need more 
big backs, right? They they want guys that can be a little bit more uh, of those, uh, you know, bigger bodies just to be able to to take the grind of of the game. And uh, Hunter is is one of those guys. And you know, in high school, he rushed for over a thousand yards. You know, he's he's a guy that is is able to do what he needs to. So, uh, curious to see how he develops into that system if we get to see him a little bit. Uh, but for right now, I mean, that, that, that room is Mackay Bernard, Jalen Glover, Mike Mitchell. Uh, beyond that, it, it becomes a little bit more questionable, right? Charlie Vinson has gotten time as a walk-on, and uh, Quinton Ganther had talked about in spring that, you know, he's trying not to give him the ball. And the reason he's trying not to give him the ball is because he's a walk-on, right? Like, you've got to earn your, your role. And he said that Charlie keeps making plays to, to, to get that, right? Like, he, he deserves time on the field. So... Uh, does he push for some of those minutes? We'll see. Uh, I can't imagine he's in that that early rotation, but maybe maybe he gets some. Dijon Stanley, John Randall, uh, these are two other guys. They're they're the smaller framed guys, right? Like one seventy eight for Dijon Stanley, uh, one eighty two for John Randall. Uh, by all accounts, from what I've I've heard and seen, that they're, they're just not ready yet. Uh, they're not up to that level. They could be used. You know, Dijon Stanley has a lot of speed, for example. Uh, maybe you use him in a different variety of ways that that. The other guys don't, um, but I, I, it, it's one of those things where moving Hunter over uh, really helped them to be able to kind of add some some size to that room. Um, but with, with that said, you know, there's a lot of people that are concerned that like a Makai Bernard can't be that guy that, you know, he, a lot of people see him as like a smaller framed guy. He's not, he's not the, the big guy. The reality is, is he's pretty much the same as, as most of these guys. Like I was going through this to kind of uh, a check. You know, he's listed at six foot. That may be a little generous. Um, he's, he's maybe close, and so maybe you get that with the hair. Uh, but he's six foot, 206. Jalen Glover's 5'8", 202. Admittedly, he's smaller, right? Um, but he's got kind of the, the frame, uh, the muscle to be able to take on those things. Mike Mitchell is six foot, 211. He's much more actually the six foot. Uh, Dijon Stanley, six foot. John Randall, six foot. Charlie Vincent, 5'10". Uh, most of these guys, they're about the same size. And so I wanted to kind of see the difference there. So looking at some of, of Utah's running backs in the past, uh, the guys that, you know, you would probably look at as saying uh, were most instrumental in Utah's run success. There, there's other guys in there, and I'm not going to get into that. Um, but you have Tavion Thomas, Zach Moss, Joe Williams, and Devontae Booker, the four guys that I would say probably were the closest to the bell cow backs that, that Utah's had over the last little bit. Other guys have mixed in there, the TJ Pledgers, you know, Armand Shine, those guys, but the, uh, they just didn't have those same reps as these other guys. Tavion, he comes in as as the biggest guy, right? He was 6'2", 225. If anything, he was a little too big uh, weight-wise. You know, they were trying to cut some weight off of him, and, uh, you know, there's there's some other issues there beyond that. Um, he, was, he was your biggest guy out of that group. But all those other guys, Zach Moss, 5'10", 222, Joe Williams, 5'11", 205, Devontae Booker, 5'11", 212, these are the same size, essentially, as a Makai Bernard. Makai, you know, he's, he's put on some weight, and, and that's helped him. But, like, I don't, I don't think that there's anybody in this room that you look at and say, oh, you know, they can't be a running back, they can't be the guy uh, because they're small. If anything, they're all pretty on par with, you know, some of Utah's best running backs over the last decade plus, and so... I understand it's more that goes into the system than just that, right? Makai has to do more than just, uh, you know, pass protect, and he has to do more than catch balls out of the backfield. He's got to be able to take it to that next level. But I think you've got a room that they're comparable with anybody. It's just a matter of being able to, you know, have that vision, being able to hit the 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 line hard and be able to to find ways to break through that's what that's what separated these other guys, right? Zach Moss could turn it on to another level where he absorbed that contact and then found ways to keep pushing beyond that. You know, Joe Williams had that speed and he could hit the hole and, and, and be gone. Devontae Booker, kind of a similar to a Zach Moss type where, you know, he could just bruise guys and, and run through you. That's where Utah has to take it to that next level, right? If they want to be able to have a run game that is comparable to what they've had in those years, they need somebody to emerge that way. There's not a worry here that they don't have guys that can do what they need to, right? There's enough talent in this room that it's going to work. They've got guys on tight ends and wide receivers that they're going to scheme it to whatever they need to to be able to uh, get the ball, whether it's passing or running, in a way that's going to be effective. This isn't going to be a situation where uh, I envision where Utah just can't run the ball. Now, with that said, these last few years, it has been a little bit more rough. And I, I, I'm not going to even count last year because that was such an anomaly with the quarterback play and different things that way. 
Um, but even the year before that, there there was some stuff where uh, you know you you wanted more, right? Jaquindon Jackson obviously was able to do what he needed to do there, um, but it still wasn't to that level that Utah wanted. So. With that being said, yes, Utah wants to push it. They want more. They, they, they need more out of this room, but I think they have the guys. They're going to be fine. It's not an issue, you know, and I say that now knowing that we'll, we'll find out fully once, once it, you know, transpires on the field and whoever gets those reps, and I, I'm undoubtedly going to write an article probably about Kyle complaining about the run game. I can, I can already tell, but, you know, that's, that's just where we're at. I, I don't think that there's an issue here. I think they're going to be fine. This offensive side of the ball is fine. Uh, Kyle has talked about that they are really set on their offensive line. They have their starting five. You know, they're, they're playing together right now. Instead of trying to mix and match and figure out who their, their guys are, they have it set, and it's been essentially set since spring. So they've got some consistency. They've got camaraderie. All of those things matter in an offensive line, and that's going to help the running backs as well. All of this is going to play into that, right? You've got now tight ends. They're going to run 12, 13 personnel. That adds to it. You, you're getting a whole bunch of stuff where I don't, I don't think this run game is going to be an issue, right? I, I think it's going to take time to gel and do different things, but it's going to be fine. So I hope that helped talk you off the ledge. If you're worrying about that, I'm not the most articulate with some of that stuff, but um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there should be an issue here or a worry. It's really just a matter of how are they going to divvy up these things? Are they going to have a bell cow back or is it going to be running back by committee? I would tend to believe that it's going to be running back by committee initially, especially through that SUU game, maybe that Baylor game. Um, but once somebody separates, Kyle's more than happy to embrace him, right? Tavion Thomas was not the ideal back in terms of, of off-the-field stuff. Uh, he, he didn't really put in the work behind the scenes to, to do it. But when it came to being under the lights, he shined, right? He found ways to be able to make those plays, and so it was hard for Kyle to, uh, to not play him. But at the same time, as we saw his last year with the program, there were things that he didn't do that 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 forced Kyle to take him off the field. So uh, I don't I don't foresee that with any of these guys. That's not to say that something couldn't happen, um, but I think they're going to be in a good position and, and and everything should be good, especially with that offensive line unit that that's that's together. Uh, you know, I think you know you get Caleb Lomu, who's a redshirt freshman on that left side. He's been learning for the last year on. And what it takes to be a left tackle, uh, you know, Tanoa Toei, left guard. He's been in that spot for a long time and really emerged last year. Jaron Kump, he's obviously experienced, understands what he needs to do at the center spot. Michael Mokafisi, outside of some penalties that he he's kind of uh, gotten that have, that have hurt Utah, he's been a consistent force there. And if he can cut back on those penalties, uh, I think, you know, you've got a, a phenomenal right guard. And then Spencer Fano moves over to right tackle. Uh, he played a lot of that in high school, and so he's more comfortable there. Uh, did a phenomenal job at left tackle and, and was able to do what he needed to there. Obviously, he had some growing pains because he was a freshman, and, and you're going up against in your very first game Florida, guys that are going to be bigger, stronger, uh, understand the game a little bit better just because of, of how long they've played, and he, and he handled it well. So uh, moving him to right tackle, they, they feel really confident about that. Uh, he feels really confident about it. He talked about it last week, and... Uh, said he's excited to see how it goes. So you've got that five set. They feel really comfortable with that. You know, there's going to be some mixing and matching every once in a while, but he feels really comfortable with that. Um, and then six through 10, they're kind of jockeying for position and trying to get there. But uh, it's great for Utah to have that early consistency, uh, gets them all working together. They jive well, gel together, whatever terminology you want to go with, it helps. All of that will help the running game. All of that will help, you know, Cam stay protected. Um, all, all that stuff helps. So, Outside of that, you know, a couple names that, that we've been hearing, uh, well, I guess one name especially is Caleb Lohner. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, he's the, the basketball transfer, comes in, and is pretty much his last season uh, is moving over as a tight end in football. Uh, he's got a six foot eight, 235-pound frame, although Freddie Whittingham says it's now up to 250. Uh, it, I mean, he, regardless, he's big, right? Uh, so just from the intangibles and the measurables, he has what it takes to be able to be a prototypical tight end, if not a bigger tight end, uh, that allows him to be able to do what he needs to do, especially in the passing game where he's pretty fluid. Uh, coming as a basketball player, you know, you're not tight necessarily. You have to be fluid. You've got to be able to move. You've got to use those hips. All of that translates really well onto the field, and he's put in the time to be able to do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where he can do everything that they want him to do. Obviously, he has to learn the playbooks, has to learn how football, to some extent, is actually played. 
he hasn't played since eighth grade, so he understands football, um, but not to the level of, of a D1 athlete, right? And so he's learning that. The biggest knock towards him is, is and it's not even a knock, it's more just a, trying to figure out who he is, is once those pads come on, can he do it, right? Can he absorb hits? They're not afraid of him doing that. They say he's actually going to be fine there. They, you know, He's good. It's more, can he put it all together when the pads are on? Can he make those catches, those same catches where uh, I think it was Cam Rising said, you know, you can put it anywhere in his direction and he'll find a way to get it low, high, anywhere. He's, he's kind of like a sponge where he'll just absorb that ball and, and take it. Can he do that now with the pads? Can he understand the the route structure and the timing? It's it's not a matter of just, okay, you're going to go run a, an out route. It's a matter of doing that with precision and timing where you're going to set up Cam in a way that, that he can trust you and give you that ball. They feel really confident, right? Freddie Whittingham feels confident. Kyle Whittingham feels confident. Uh, th- there's a lot of optimism about uh, where he's at. Uh, you know, Freddie Whittingham said he has all the traits you look for in a tight end. He, he graded well in the summer. Um, all of his skill sets, he said those traditional NFL combine skill sets, he is elite. That, that, that's great, right? Like you've got to be able to have those. And if he can get those translated with the, the pads on, you know, Utah picked up a, a great, uh, a great asset and, um, he'll be one of, you know, 900 tight ends that'll be in Utah's system. And, um, it'll be interesting to see how they, they mix and match this. Uh, they've talked about how they're going to have, you know, 12 personnel, you know, two tight ends out. That's going to pretty much be their base def- or base offense. Uh, and you're going to mix and match that, right? Sometimes it's going to include Brant Keithy and, uh, you know, a um, some other guy, I, mean, I'm, I can't even think there's so many of these guys, a Landon King, for example, Carson Ryan, Miki Sugataraga, you know, you're going to mix and match these guys and, and put it in a way that, that works and, and schemes uh, well for the, for the team. With Caleb specifically, there's things where they feel comfortable, where if you can continually get him to understand the repetition of something, where you say, okay, your play is, you know, a, a five-yard out route, you know, 10-yard out route, whatever it may be that you want, they're going to be able to get it in a way that he understands that and then build from there, right? They can put him in those packages. They can do it. He can just be a tight end that's blocking. It, it, there's so many avenues for him, and they feel confident in whatever that is. So um, there's there's a lot of optimism there. Really curious to see how he develops. I want to see if we'll under you know if Kyle will give us any more uh, about him next Monday after after scrimmage. Does he is he involved? Uh, those types of things. So uh, really really curious and, and excited to some extent to, to kind of see how that goes. Cause that that's going to be a player that I think a lot of, of people are going to be fascinated by and, and, and wanting to see how he develops in the system outside of that, just a couple other names that, that have been watching tail Johnson and Smith Snowden. There's been a lot of talk about these guys on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, secondary has been kind of the talk of, of the defense. You know, there's a lot of faith in that front seven. Uh, you know, this is a lot of returning guys. So there's not been a lot of talk about them, but in that secondary, you know, Teo Johnson, who has to come in there and he has to fill the roles of a Cole Bishop, a Sione Vaki, uh, he's got to kind of take those those reins. There's a lot of, of optimism about him. Smith Snowden, who's going to be playing nickel primarily and maybe some in the in, in safety or, or at corner. You know, these two guys have gotten a lot of praise from their coaches and, and there's a lot of expectations for them coming into the season. For me, you know, those first few games, I want to see how they develop, right? Teo Johnson's played a lot more, and, and we've seen more of him, and so I don't know that there's there's a lot of uh, doubt there, uh, to some extent even with Smith Snowden because he's done it. But where can these guys take it to that next level, right? Can they impact the game the same way as a Cole Bishop, a Sione Vaki, the guys before them? You know, Teo Johnson gets a lot of comps to uh, Julian Blackman. Can he be that type of a guy, the ball hawk, but also lay the blow? We've seen him lay the blow, so that's not uh, not the question there. Um, but what what are their, you know, individual characteristics that's going to make them excel? So uh, that'll be fun. We're going to learn that in a few weeks when we obviously see real football um, but these are some of the names that they're talking about and, and guys that are, have been really making some progress. Uh, guys behind them, though, you know, there's a lot of optimism about them as well. They're just a little bit more unexperienced. They haven't seen the field. Uh, and so that's really where these next few, next few days especially are going to help, where they're going to try to find out who is uh, the guys to fill behind them. So uh, that's... That's essentially it for this week. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to get more updates next week, uh, probably a lot better updates as, as now we'll have a, a, a scrimmage to go through. 
Um, but right now it's really just kind of gearing up for the season, right? This, there, there's not a lot of questions for this team right now. It's really just, can they live up to those expectations? Can they uh, do what they need to with the target on their back? You know, Kyle has traditionally run as, as the underdog mentality and, and, you know, everybody's doubting us. Even when they're picked the favorite USC was in the conference and Oregon was in the conference and, you know, they're always going to be looked at as the top team. This is where Utah now has to really cement themselves and say, you know what, as the top dog, as the team to beat in the big 12, we can do it. We won't know any of that really until the games start being played. Um, but I think you really have to lock in right now and not, not to the point where you're so prideful that, you know, you don't think you're ever going to lose. Utah found that out a few years ago that, you know, you come into this, you start getting those, those, those momentums where you're beating teams by a lot of points. And then you start taking the foot off the gas a little bit. You start, you know, believing in your own press and, and things change that way. Uh, this is, this is kind of where Utah's going to develop that. And I don't get a sense that they, they're prideful about that. They definitely believe that they should be in the playoffs. They definitely believe that they should win a, a big 12 championship, but how do they continue to put in the work? And, and by all accounts, everything that I've seen in the after periods, um, that's the only periods we get to watch. This is a team that is, is ready to go. And so, uh, excited to see how it, it develops, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to add more, uh, to what's going on. Uh, hopefully have some, some more things to talk about and, and get going, but we're getting closer. Football is, is, is really close and, and I'm excited to see how it goes. So, that's going to be it for today. We will uh, come back again next week as we we look more at uh, you know recapping what happened in the scrimmage, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. But I appreciate you listening, and uh, we'll chat next week.